up. Yo, long hairs. Welcome to episode 116 of Let It Ride. Here we talk long hair in business, advocate for hair equality, and celebrate men's long manes with hair whips and high fives. If you're a guy with long hair, you're in the right place. I'm El Rubio, co-founder and CEO of The Long Hairs. To my right, co-hosting with our creative director is El Elefante. With us here at The Long Hairs Global Headquarters is our guest on today's episode. He is a corporate facilitator, a keynote speaker, certified coach, and self-proclaimed strategic play consultant who helps professionals level up their confidence, creativity, and happiness all through the power of play. Gary shows us how play positively affects us in the workplace, optimizing team engagement and morale, and hoping to maximize workplace success. But it's not all business, as Gary highlights the importance of play in our personal lives as well, offering rest, rejuvenation, and enjoyment in life, admonishing us to reconnect and stay connected with our childlike wonder and imagination. He is the founder and principal of Breakthrough Play, a San Diego consulting firm that helps people and organizations all around the world improve retention, reduce stress, raise sales, and have more fun playing. An improv comedian by night, soon to be by day, perhaps. He is the author of Playful Rebellion, recently published to much critical acclaim and available wherever fine books are sold. He is with us. He is unscripted. And he is not playing around about playing around. It's time to play ball with Gary Ware. Oh, my gosh. Can can I just have you travel with me and and deliver that like i will pay you a little bit i think if uh, the whole long hair thing doesn't work out we have a calling in radio announcing there we go gary welcome to let it ride thank you so much for having me uh i know this is a lot in the making and i'm glad we are here right now in this moment making this making this work. Hey, it took a couple of reschedules, a yes. couple of pushbacks. You had some family news and <laughs> COVID kept on happening, but we're getting it done today. We're done. Yes. Uh, so we were introduced through our former, sadly, social media director, Chuck Karen Cross. But you've known Elefante for some time as well. Just uh, bring us up to speed on how you got acquainted with the long hairs and what brought you here today. Yeah. Um, well, one, I, I have long hair. Uh, so I, I've always you know, watched from, uh, from a distance. Uh, you know, we're all San Diego uh, based companies. So, so I love it. Um, yeah, me and uh, Elefante, we go way back. Uh, the agency days of cutting our teeth um, like Mad Men, but not really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> being trapped in like the basement, uh, you know, forced to pump out digital ads. A lot of connections and in, uh, interwebs in the digital marketing space. Uh, El Moreno and I were in a marketing agency prior to the long hairs, and that's how we got to know Elefante and Garvinsky. And uh, as our circles continue pat, uh, crossing over the years, uh, this happens a lot. We're, we know someone of someone, and uh, we're not far th- that far out of the circle. Yeah, especially, again, in San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a small city, and... Yeah, you'll be surprised. It's like the, was it the six degrees of Kevin Bacon sort of situation? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can pick someone in San Diego and and then sort of backtrack and yeah, we're we're connected. It's not even going to be six. It's going to yeah. be about yeah. two or like three, three and a half max. That that advertise the advertising world is so small here. It is. You know, the, the San Diego in general is a relatively small big city, but then you drill down into the marketing advertising world and everyone knows everybody yeah and everyone go like they go from one agency to the other yep. to the other to the other it's like one of those um i don't know those abusive relationships. you're like you know what the next one's gonna be better <laughs> you know what the next one will be better that you get into it that you're like oh wow it's the same it's, the same. it's not greener over here yeah after all yeah uh, so, Playful Rebellion, congratulations. Thank Just you. published this year. This year. Tell us a little bit I about to the do book. This during the intro. Look at this beautiful cover, beautiful artwork, illustrations. There's a lot to love here, having gone through it just before our show here. Tell us a little bit about the book and how you came to this concept and, and the publishing process. Yeah. So, this concept, um, I wanted to write a book 
that would teach the younger version of myself something that I wish I knew <laughs> when I was younger. And the whole thing, a playful rebellion, like what, what's the deal? Well, one, I love Star Wars, so any sort of like not to Star Wars, I'm in it. However, um, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, most people like play what? That four letter word that starts with P, adults aren't having it. And it's just because we're conditioned. We're conditioned to work, work, work. And if we have a little bit of time, maybe we can play. Play is something that kids do is seen as a frivolous activity. And I learned firsthand um, after burning myself out multiple times that the anecdote is play. And if I can incorporate play intentionally on a day-to-day -day basis, I can rejuvenate myself, um, I can connect deeper. And so the reason why it's called the Playful Rebellion as a way to reach uh, and have those benefits, we need to rebel against the status quo. We gotta rebel against our sort of way of being. And so that's sort of the, the book um, and it's, yeah, it's been a labor of love. Um, it started out, to be honest, as a challenge uh, because a number of people said, you know, Gary, I, I really wish I can incorporate play, but I every time I try to get into it, other stuff happens, you know, I work and stuff. And so I did a 30 day play challenge where I helped, you know, people develop um, a habit. And then someone said, this would be great if it was a book. And I was like, Mm, interesting. I never really thought about writing a book. And then after like the fourth person said, hey, can this be a book? I was like, all right, I'll think about it. Um, writing a book, again, some people, yeah, I have all these books in me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a published author. That was never my thought. However, I was like, yeah, this could be a book, but I don't want to do it the conventional route of let me lock myself in my office and crank out 5,000 words per day. Like that seems like torture and for a book about play like that's not very playful so how I did it was I um, I got an editor and we scheduled a zoom call um, for one hour every week for nine months you know after we figured out what the you know, structure was gonna be and all that stuff and then I would tell stories you know we would pick the chapter I would tell stories she would ask me questions and then after the call she, and it's great because she was didn't really know much about it. So she was very curious and she would ask me things and it would prompt me to think of other stuff. And then she would give me a challenge. She was like, all right, cool, this week, go and research these things and let's come back and talk about it. And so we essentially had uh, a really fun uh, Zoom date for nine months um, and that became, and so we transcribed all those things. And that was basically the rough draft, uh, the first uh, draft of the manuscript. And then we went through the editing process. And so that's how the book, um, you know, got created. And then I talked to some people about publishing around or self-publishing. And then, you know, based on my, my end objective is to, you know, get this into people's hands as quickly as possible. And then again, since I'm a facilitator, um, I want to use this as, you know, part of my work. People said, yeah, get this, do go the self-publishing route. And so, you know, before we started, we were talking about um, some mutual people that we know, Chris Gillibo being another, he's written books on that. Um, I have other friends who've done the self-publishing route. And so I just, you know, got my hands dirty and, and figured it all out. And then <laughs> nine more months later, here we go. Yeah. What I'm curious, getting into a new thing like writing, coming from advertising, marketing, improv, comedy, how long did it take you from the time you started writing the book so you called yourself a writer or thought of yourself as a writer. Great point. It took a while because I kept saying, I'm writing a book. And so someone said, you're an author. Yeah. Well, I get, maybe. So yeah, it, it, was, it was a good like three or four months. It was a good three or four months and a good like dozen people saying, so you're an author with a capital A. And I was like, fine, <laughs> I'm an author. Yeah. There we go. And even now me saying it like that, that just sounds weird, but. Sure the lesson that I hear over and over again, like, Hey, if you have a story to tell, you're an author, mm. like you're writing, whether it is a, you know, digital book, paperback book, hard, you know, cover book, audio book, you're, you're an author. Yeah. You're the author of your own story, as they say. Uh, so the, the concept behind the book, this whole notion of kind of rediscovering play and its value and your in all of our professional and personal lives, you said that you had taken an improv class where you kind of made that self-discovery. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. So the irony uh, of this is that I didn't take the class 
to go and have fun. <laughs> this was one of my first agency gigs. Uh, it was a company that since been acquired by company after company. It's called Cavario. I found myself as um, a director, and I had a under me like a staff of like twenty or so, and then I wanted to get better at you know at my at the craft and presentations and and speaking to clients was one of the requirements and I took a Toastmasters class and I hated it yes it's great framework of how to deliver a a talk and whatnot but it gave me so much anxiety because they're literally judging you Mm, you know that talk Gary you had 16 ums did you notice that you're blah 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 and and so I needed something else and a mentor of mine said hey have you thought about taking an improv class and I was like no I'm not a comedian what are you talking about he said no I, I think it will help with public speaking and thinking on your feet. So I said, all right, cool, sign me up. And even better, my company paid for it because we had $1,000 per employee per year that we can use for personal development. Most people went to conferences. I took an improv class. So I took this improv class expecting to sort of level up my ability to speak. And then to my shock, uh, I got hooked uh, because that first class, it was at a theater uh, here in San Diego there were about 15 other people just like me. They, no one was aspiring to be on SNL. Granted, we're, we're in San Diego. We're not in LA. We're not in Chicago. We're not in New York. So these are just regular people that just want to take an improv class. And to my surprise, we played these weird games where we had to, you know, sort of be silly and, you know, sort of word association. And, you know, they taught us these principles like um, to say yes and, um, and to um, realize that there are no mistakes, everything's a gift. And for two hours, I was completely present. I was completely mesmerized. I was engaged. And it reminded me of recess. And after that first class, I, I went home and my wife thought I was drunk. I, <laughs> I, I had not had anything to drink. Um, and, uh, huh? I was, yeah, high on life. And then that next day I was excited to go to work. Everything else was still the same. Clients were still the same. Everything else was the same. And that was the catalyst. That was the thing that was like, maybe there's something here. And then I just got hooked on improv and I started bringing games to my team. I started taking it to conferences and then I started performing and that became like my, my play. And, and then I started saying, all right, cause in improv, we have this thing. If this is true, then what else is true? So I was like if this is making me feel this good and I can shove off all of like stress and drama, like what else? And then I just started like diving into play and and then I started rediscovering the things that I used to do when I was a kid that I thought I had no time for. When you started looking into this, sorry, I'll let you go. Uh, Did you look and see, is anyone else doing this? Is anyone else using play as their concept? Did you kind of start doing some research and were were there others doing it or not not doing it like you're doing it? Yeah, so naturally once you start to, um, so this was a hobby at first. This like, and all the stuff I was learning was all in service of me being a better leader. Um, However, when you start to say, oh yeah, I'm the play guy. I'm discovering how to use play X, Y, and Z then people naturally will say, hey, have you met such and such? So at first I was like, I just thought I was just like, you know, just whatever. And then I I met a whole community of play folks. Uh, It started with uh, this gentleman, his name is uh, Kevin Carroll. Um, He has an amazing TED talk uh, about a red uh, rubber ball. He um, used to work for Nike, um, has like, crazy upbringing. And and for him, like play was that savior and and whatnot, and great great speaker um and then i i met a, another good friend of mine um his name is jeff harry and then I, I just a whole community of play people um and it was just all oh what you like to play and then we just started like literally like forming this tribe and you're right we all do play in our own unique way uh but it was like yeah we you know, we got, we got to rise up. Um, and it's, you will be surprised. Some people like my friend, uh, Kirsten Anderson, uh, she uses, uh, Legos as a way to activate people's imagination and, uh, help them be more innovative. And, and my friend, Amy Angelilli, she use, uses improv, like, like how I do it. And then like, yeah, so it's, you will be surprised. Um, there's a, a gentleman, he, he is called Primal Play, and he is, to be honest, he's a big hit in the people that are into keto uh, because they're all about like, let me be a caveman. Yeah. And then he, he uses um, playful things instead of like uh, going to the gym. It's like, let's do bear crawls. And, and we're doing like these like sort of 
like things that you would do in recess. And then believe it or not, you're burning calories. You're not thinking about going to the gym. Um, and he has an amazing talk on, um, on it, it is why working out is not working out. <laughs> Um, what were some of those in that very first improv class when you went back to work the next day, what were some of the, like, let's say like two or three key things that just changed the way you saw it? Like you said, you said that it's the same clients, same company, same office, but something switched. What was it that like, was it a new perspective on how to deal with client problems or was it a new perspective on how to interact with employees or your subordinate subordinates, whatever collaborators, like what were those like initial, like, Oh shit, this is like, I'm seeing this totally differently. Yeah. So before I learned what I learned about like the science and the neuroscience, which I'll tell you in a minute, the, the biggest thing was I was like not stressed. I went into the office again, everything was the same. There were still the same, uh, deliverables and the clients were still being the clients, but I was just coming from a place of sort of Zen. And because of that, I was just more able to just access creativity. And so what I learned as I started studying like the neuroscience and whatnot, most of us, the reason why we're burnt out is that we're running, like we're revving at like, you know, uh, on the RPM scale, like eight or nine, we're at red line and it's, we're uh, producing adrenaline and cortisol and our bodies aren't meant to do that on a consistent basis. Um, it's meant to just do it to fight stress, done, and then go back to like, chill um so go from the sympathetic uh nervous system to the parasympathetic that's the rest and digest however um because our stressors in this day and age don't go away emails are still there to-do lists are still a mile long uh, there are people screaming at us and our brains are processing it as if we have a saber-toothed tiger on our back except constantly. constantly and so no wonder why we're always on edge and what I did was I stepped away from that. Um, there, I talk about it in the book, there's different types of, of rest. And what I essentially did was called a meso rest, where you step away from the work and do something that brings you joy, whether it's a hobby, whatever it is, and then you're still gonna make those connections. And so it allows your body to sort of recalibrate. And so that's what happened. I was flooded with dopamine and, and um, dopamine and endorphins and all those neurochemicals that like, help you activate the creativity centers of your brain. Yeah. And so I went in and I was able to see things differently yeah. because I wasn't in that lizard brain mode. Sure. Here's a follow up question to the dopamine. Uh, is there, is there anything like you, maybe this is part of the course or something, but yeah. like a dopamine reset. Cause we were inundated with social media, all the pings, all the dings, all the bright lights. Um, is there anything that you do on top of like this dopamine rush of play to like level back out? Like our, like, cause we are as stressful as we are, we are still getting a constant drip dopamine drip in IV form via cell phone. So is there anything you, you recommend for like doing a, doing a reset or like trying to balance those stressors? Yeah. So one is awareness. You bring up a good point that we have a constant drip of dopamine because we have uh, these devices that are mega computers in our pocket that can give us information like that. Most people don't realize what it's doing. So uh, fun, fun uh, experiment that I, I wish everyone knew about because then they would see uh, the fact that they're checking social media or email differently. So uh, researchers did this experiment with bonobos, the monkeys. Their favorite um, beverage uh, like is, is uh, blackberry juice. And so they, they put them, they strapped them in this like sort of computer thing and they had to, they taught them to do this sequence. And when they did it right, they got pure uh, blackberry juice right in their mouth. They're like, ah, mm, so good. And it conditioned them to like do it again. Ooh, more blackberry juice. Again, that's, that's the dopamine hit. So then they were curious, all right, if they get it right and we don't give like like 100%, like we, we sort of dilute it with water or something, would they give up? Yeah. Guess what? No, they worked harder mm. because it would be random when they would get the pure blackberry juice. And so then at one point they took the straps off. Yeah. All their other monkey friends are going out to play they're still doing it. And then like, they'll get diluted. 
oh, I got, I got the hit, I got the good one. Yeah. And so that is what we're doing when we're checking email, when we're scrolling through social, we're looking for that thing that is unconscious. We don't like, where's that email? Like that email from that the one or whatever, like, and Chasing all the, digital dragon. yeah, and it's just never showing up. Like it's Sasquatch or whatever, like yeah. it's gonna show up, but it's never there. It's usually spam, it's like, you know, and then we don't realize that it has a hold on us. So, so that awareness is key of realizing what's happening. Um, and then we need to sort of replace it because you can't just, yes, we, yes, there are such things as uh, digital detox. Matter of fact, um, a friend of mine, he's in, in Canada, um, just did, uh, I think it was called Camp Reset. And it was a weekend where it was play based, but cell phones were taken away. Like all of those digital, like sort of things that would weigh on us gone for the weekend and then um it was all about community it was all about like connection and stuff like that and people like came back like whoa like and, and then sort of like they walk back into the real world like oh, what's going on um so that is important to have that detox um but um it's one of those things where if you don't replace it with something else you know you can easily go back to it and so that's where i invite people to do uh what is called a play history you know when you were younger what did you do like for fun and enjoyment. And when I say play, this is where most people like, they think, oh, it's sports or this and the other. Yeah, that's one form of play. Play is anything that you do just for the sake of it, where you can do it for hours. You know, it stimulates you personally. And so again, this is a very personal experience. And, um, you know, you're getting the enough sort of feedback and challenge and stuff like that. And then you're getting into that flow state. Figure out what that is for you. And then instead of like when you're, you know, having some downtime instead of like jumping on social media. How about you do that? You know, it could be crocheting, you know, it could be building with Legos. Um, I was working with someone and um, it was during the pandemic and her form of play used to be travel. That was next. And so, you know, after doing a uh, play history, she realized that she used to take care of dolls. She loved collecting dolls. And she told me, Gary, I'm not, I'm not going to go buy some Barbies. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not, that's not what I'm telling you. Let's break that down. What's the essence of what you were doing? And she's like, well, I was collecting and I was nurturing. I was like, all right, what else could you collect and nurture? And then she ended up succulents. Plant lady. And Big she, plant lady, she yeah. became the plant lady. She became, and, and so again, that's not for everyone. That's not everyone's jam. Yeah, yeah. But, for her, but for her, she has over like, I think 200 succulents wow. and, and she is propagating them. And she's like a mad scientist when it comes to that. And to her, that is what she's spending her excess time on instead of being on social media where she's being like sort of inundated with messages like she's not enough and this, that, and the yeah, other. Yeah. And again, she's learning something. You know, she's, uh, she's learning something, she's creating something, she's having com uh, like community, she's bringing and gifting things. And so I, hopefully that answered your question. Totally. I, I, yeah. 100%. Yeah, the question was like, is there a dopamine kind of reset that you follow up, you know, with or, or whatever, but to, to, to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about the, um, God, I lost my train of thought. The creator consumer switch. Yeah. When you are stuck on your phone, you're not making, you are just consuming. Yes. And it's that like, give me, give me more, more, more versus the creator. You, it's a, it's a whole different mentality Completely. and there's, this like um, autonomous like superpower that you feel when you f first take like a thing, I've experienced it when you take a thing from an idea you to on paper to then development and then now it's like it exists and people buy it or wear it or whatever. It's like, holy shit, I am fucking God, dude. I just made this thing, dude, and it exists. And it's like that. It just re it's like this snowball effect mm -hmm. and you're just like making more, making more, making more, making more. And yeah, you're playing and creating yeah, versus just like play. sitting and consuming. Yeah. First thing I thought about was making forts with the trees and branches and going out behind the house and spending hours building a fort just in case, you know, the bad guys came. Right? <laughs> it's play. Yeah. yeah. And so like, and I've had people like that that say, well, Gary, I don't, you know, that's childish. I don't want to build a fort. It's like, all right, well, what, what, what does that mean to you? And how can you replace that? And maybe it's not a fort, but like, 
go get some you know two by fours and stuff like we're adults now so like when we were kids like we had to be super scrappy like now you can go to home depot get some two by fours right go well, get like coffee table. right build a coffee table like yeah. exactly go get some blueprints uh, like off of the internet and, and like build something and again like yes um it'll be great like if you want to sell it but to some people like just do it and like that satisfaction so um in europe actually they're having doctors that are prescribing things like this instead of medication wow. man because again you get this feeling of satisfaction of completing something sure. like that and again you don't have to go sell it but like look like it reminds me of ron swanson like on um uh parks and rec where he like look at this chair that i built like yeah. you know <laughs> and he's like yeah yeah like and it's just like something he did with his hands and it was like his jam yeah, very empowering. What do you say if people, well, I would just watch TV. If someone were to say, if you were to ask the, uh, what was it, the play history yeah, yeah. exercise, if someone said, just watch TV. Okay, so I would like to take it to the next level. All right, what do you watch on TV? Uh, because one of the play personalities is the storyteller. And it's like to get lost in it. And so I have a friend who's a, a movie file. And so, so what she would do is like she went through a phase where she was looking up like uh, old films that were in a specific genre. And she would go and, and watch them and she would like sort of analyze them. So it's something where it's like, yes, you can go watch this, but like how can you be more involved than just – like almost like a zombie. So Letting like, yeah, yeah. If, if you're if you're into like movies, go watch them. But after you're done, like start to think about and analyze them, like and get like involved and maybe go look up who's the director of this. And and so it's more than just a consumption of it. You could even write a list of your favorite movies. Right. Yeah. That would be an exercise. It's creative, and then we'll put them into genres now. Yeah. Your sci-fi or your horror, yeah. or your comedy or your what have you. Yeah. Or, or go write. Uh, go read the book version, then go go watch the movie, and then you know start to like have an intellectual discussion with your friends about it. Yeah. I just asked the question about TV as a devil's advocate because I feel like a lot of people kind of default to I want to rest, and I'm, I'm just going to go and sit in front of the boob tube for a couple hours. Where there, there some benefits, sure, and some positive things out of that, but it's not that engaging, playful experience that is connecting to the positive feelings and the feelings of some kind of a accomplishment or making or, or creating or, you know, something that's going to give you a little bit better feeling out of it. Yeah. So to that point. It's all about intentionality. Uh, Jane McGonagall, she wrote this amazing book called Super Better, and it was about how games and playfulness um, can actually help you um, overcome so many things like PTSD and, and um, you know, disease and, and things like that and, and how you can create, like, an alter ego. And, and it's an amazing book. And she was saying that there is, you know, what's the difference between using play as a superpower and using play to your detriment? And there's just one thing. Um, so there's lots of research that shows that like, yeah, play can be like, can ruin your life and all this other stuff. Like, you know, the people that are stuck in their basement playing World of Warcraft for like hours on end and then they can't like leave and socialize and stuff like that. And then the people um, who actually use uh, a game like Candy Crush to overcome, um, you know, PTSD, like from being in the military. Um, you know, again, it's play, uh, but yet they had two different um, outcomes. And the one thing is, what is your intention? If your intention is like, you know what, um, I'm going to engage in this for a period of time because it's going to help me do X. Cool. You will reap the benefits. Or it's like, I can't deal with life, so I'm going to engage in this just to like completely escape. And then again, you just you're not you don't want to deal with it. So then you just do this. So then it becomes your pattern you know what, I can't deal with this, so I'm just going to escape to this. And, and yeah, that's where the maybe the binge watching and stuff like that comes from. But guess what? That can happen to anything. Mm -hmm. You know what, I can't deal with life right now, so I'm just going to go exercise. And and you still don't deal with life. And then that becomes your your sort of pattern. And so, um, you know, or, or maybe it's eating, or maybe it's actually what most adults do, working. I can't deal with, like, life as an adult, so I'm going to overwork myself and yada, yada, yada. So play, um, yes, when you have the right intention, you can reap the benefits. And so, like, yes, um, ideally, if it's something where you're engaging with other people, you know, that really helps, um, you know, uh, yeah, there's like a fine line with like sort of engaging in, in sort of TV. Um, that's why uh, one of the things that um, I like to do is be intentional about it. Um, I turned off the auto, the auto load like on Netflix and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I actually have to like 
Am I going to watch another yeah. episode? This is my choice. Hmm. Actually, no. I think I think I'm good. Cool. All right. Let me step in. Let me do something else. So the intention escape versus what? Uh, well, escape Inten- versus like just being intentional about like what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And yes, that there is sense. a plane. Uh, uh, time and space for escapism. However, escapism can easily lead to like sort of like addictive uh, behavior, and it doesn't have to be play. It can be with anything. Yep, that totally makes sense. Um, do you have any? Did you have something on the? Uh, I was not specific. I was going to ask how you have you been able to. So obviously, the book came a little bit later, but you had started up the business. You've started on the speaking circuit and doing some corporate coaching and things like that. How did that develop from the idea into? And that, I'm assuming the book is kind of basically the uh, culmination or up to this point. Yes, yeah, all the wisdom. So, um. <laughs> Like I said earlier, my intention was to use all this knowledge to lead teams. Um, I thought it was going to be my mission to like create, um, you know, be in the digital marketing, you know, realm and agency life. And I found myself, you know, co-founding an agency. Um, You, I think you remember that. Um, And I was doing this on the side. It was like my little side hustle. It was just a hobby, something I did uh, for fun Um, and I didn't have to think about like how much am I charging for this? Um, and there was this one point when I was in Nicaragua, um, I was leading a retreat and it was the last day of the retreat. We were at the beach. I'm looking at the sunset. There was these little turd, uh, tortoises or turtles going to the ocean, you know? And, and then I like see like the little trails and I'm like, I turned to my co-facilitator, Amy. I'm like, I think I figured it out. Like I have something that can afford me the ability to do something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, and I, I'm feeling this sense of harmony. I felt just so much so that I got a tattoo. Um, no, uh, harmony. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, um, and then I go back, um, you know, uh, and then I check in with my business partner and that Monday he broke up with me. He basically said, I think we should go our separate ways. Uh, here's your buyout check. Uh, I'm taking the business and I'm going, over here and then get this two hours later i kid you not our landlord uh he calls me and he said sorry i'm gonna have to sell your house that i've been renting to you for like the last five years um and again larry he was our landlord like you know uh, when he told me this circumstance i'm like yeah you you need to sell the house uh he gave us like 45 days uh to get our things in order my wife wasn't working uh my son was about to be one and i'm like ooh. What do I do? And, and, and I like, I could have just gotten another gig. Like, I'm pretty sure, I, you know, could have, you know, went to a few places like, hey, look. Um, but that's where I said, maybe this is not my path that I thought. Maybe it is this facilitation. Maybe it's using play as a vehicle for change and transformation. And when I got the support from my wife where she was like, yeah, I, I think you should do that. Uh, then we sold everything. Um put stuff into storage we moved in with my parents and then I was like all right I gotta figure this out and so that was like the start of granted like yes I've been working on this for a bit but this was like me like saying this is what I'm going to do and um that was five years ago it's not until you lose everything <laughs> that you're really free to do anything uh-huh. Tyler, oh. Durden. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Durden shout out to Fight Club how do you talked a little bit about burnout and like how, how you got so burned out in the, in the digital marketing space and agency life, how being that this is a new ish Avenue for you, how do you see you managing burnout when it's your own thing? Cause there's the saying like, you know, work a nine to five, you'll work nine to five, start your own business. You work 24 seven. Yes. So how do you, how do you manage burnout? How do you kind of compartmentalize like work, life balance? I hate that phrase. I think there's seasons. I think there's, you know, sometimes you just got to work hard. Yeah. Sometimes you, there is no work. So I think that work life balance is a bit of a farce, but how would you say, how, how would you instruct somebody to manage burnout when they're running their own thing and, and you know, you spinning your wheels is as far as you're going to go. So you have to continue to go, but like you need frameworks. Um, because most people who 
jump into their own thing. They probably came from working a nine to five and they were on that framework. And so again, that is like the muscle memory where you feel like, oh, my productivity is tied uh, or like my self-worth is tied to my productivity. Um, and it's an, it's a slippery slope. Um, and then you hear things like, well, you know what, if you're doing what you love, then you never work a day in your life, right? However, your body will you know tell you different um and that's one of the things that i quickly learned because in the beginning it was fun it was play and it still is um and then like i easily got like so caught up in it and then i realized like oh wow i'm not really sleeping as much as i used to um and then wow i'm like self-consumed and then and then it was like very embarrassing that i'm this guy that teaches people about play and uses play as a vehicle and then i'm burnt out and I'm burnt out on the thing <laughs> that I yeah. should be doing. So anyways, so you need a framework. To answer your question, you need a framework. And this is one of the things where if you um, set up a framework where you can um, uh, really be intentional, then, because burnout happens slowly over time, where you, like at one point, like like imagine you have like a gauge, um, that gauge doesn't refill back to 100% because you're starting to be burnt out. Like it refills only back to like 50%. Mm -hmm. And then if only to 25%, and then it's like one of those old school iPhones that by 11 is like dead already. Yeah. And so um, that's why I talk a lot about rest in the book of, um, you know, having a system where, you know, ev everyone says, well, you know, eight hours. Yes, that's what the research says. But I can't tell you to get eight hours of sleep if you're not even used to that. All I'm telling you is get um, decent sleep. So if you're only going to sleep for four hours, is it restful four hours? Or is it four hours where you just essentially, um, you're, you're like my five-year-old that like goes all the way and then he like passes out on the couch yeah. you're like and then like you know you have your iphone in your hand and you're you got this that and the other yeah. and that's not going to be restful sleep sure. because i can see people that you know they have a process and you know they you know don't have like um like certain stimulation before they go to bed and then they can sleep five hours and then it will be better than if you did all these other things and you try to sleep eight hours like, yeah. like so I'm on my phone for the hour before bed, right sleep eight. It may not be as Rest, yeah. Restful as someone five, but it's like, yeah, they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're drinking water before bed and they're reading a book and all, yeah, exactly. And so, um, do what you can to have a process to get rest. Um, the other thing is again, the people that are going to, that are working on their business all the time, guess what? Are you, and as humans, we're bad at this. We're, there's lots of research that shows that we're bad at knowing how much energy we have because we will say, you know what? I think I can power through this. And then uh, if you were to be honest, are you as as effective as you were, you know, had you like taken a break? And so one of the things that I have in my schedule is I have blocks of breaks like I like it is in my schedule. And so I get to this point, I'm like I got to take a break because if I don't, I know that I have a tendency to like, oh, I'm just. I just work on this for a little bit longer. I just do this. And so I have certain things. And so in those break times, well, now I, I work from home and, and I have a five-year-old. Um, well, he's in school now, but like when he wasn't, it was like I step out of my office. He hears the doors like, and he's like, Dada, Dada. Yeah. And like I hear the feet. <laughs> hey, Dada, are we going to play? Are we going to, yeah, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'm like, I wanted to just, just chill. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, but yeah, have, you know, start to create rituals. Um, so that you can rejuvenate yourself because yeah, like someone, um, you know, if like, if you like add up all the time that they're working, it may just be like eight hours, um, um, spread over a day, you know, a full day, but like, you know, they, um, you know, uh, maybe they had like a 30 minute, um, time period where they were just sort of out and about just doing stuff. Um, you know, that's how my day usually is because, you know, we, we have a newborn and I have a five-year-old. So like, I'll have a period where I'm like, all right, this is my deep work period where I'm going to be working on these things. And then, all right, cool. I have a, a space where now like I'm going to do this other stuff. But if I don't have something to put in that container, I can easily find myself doing things that are not going to rejuvenate myself, like scrolling on social media, checking email or obsessing about X, Y, and Z. So I have like, you know, like, oh, all right, cool. All right. Yeah. I'm going to do these things. Um, a lot of it is revolving around kids, but you know, whatever. It's all good. Well, who better to play with? 
Oh yeah, yeah. My my son, he know he knows what's up. Yeah, like, he knows what's up. <laughs> he, he, yeah, he knows he knows how to play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he and he's teaching me. And most adults, uh, like that have kids, they like they come to me and like, why is it so hard to play with our kids? I was like, because they're jerks, <laughs> and, and, and they only want to play a certain way. They're they're yeah. they're, they're not. It's called I win. Yeah, yeah. They play right. the game. Any game you're playing, right? The, Just like in big. The day, game is like, I win. I win. Yeah. <laughs> or he's like, this is mine's now. Yeah. <laughs> like, really? Yeah. Cool. Fun. All right. Yeah. So Gary, we got to talk about the hair. Yeah, let's you got it. beautiful. I gotta say that's at least eight years of more. growth. Longer, okay, well, more. Gotta I've be, trimmed, dude. but I, I yes, but yes. Keep going. Tell us the hair story. Have you always had long hair? Is it a more recent? Well, it's not that recent, clearly. But uh, for anyone who's just listening, I gotta say it's a good sixteen to eighteen inches. Your locks. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about your hair story. Yes, so. I've been growing my hair, uh, so I've had locks since 06. And I've been, like, the funny thing is, I, my intention on getting it was to, like, not do much with it, but I found that I, I do, I, I have to do more, like, with my hair now than what I did prior. Um, but in the beginning, it was, so I've had locks since before, like, they were, like, super cool. Like, you know, like, now you can look and you can see, you know, black guys everywhere. Like, oh, yeah, locks, 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 like, you know. Before, like, it was like a few, but like, it's still the stigma behind it was like, mm -hmm. you smoking weed? Well, you know, what, yeah, what's, what's yeah. the deal? But for growing locks, the one thing I didn't know, and if I would have known this, I might not have went this route, but in the beginning, it's awkward. Like, it like it looks weird, and it takes a while before it lies down. Like, it looks for, like ODB. Right, yeah, yeah, right? ODB, yeah, like, yeah. you had, like, these, like, little twists it looks like all over the place. And, yeah. I, and I remember after I got it done, um, well, the first, like, month or so, like, it's fine, like, because it's, like, all new and stuff like that. But, like, month three... It's starting to grow and it's starting to lay down, but it just looks awkward. Mm -hmm. And then I was again working at um, a place. I'm glad that they like they didn't like. Well, some of your hair. Um, they you know they were they were cool with it. And then um, it was, I think it was like by month five, it was finally like, all right, this is looking pretty good. And actually, my wife was like, perfect because then we took uh, engagement photos oh, nice. and it looked it looked. <laughs> so at what length? At what length? We talk a lot about the awkward stage. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. At what length does do you think you leave the awkward stage as a guy with locks? For me, it was once it got past my ears. Okay. So it took a while. That's a like, while. Yeah, because yeah. before, because it just is laying on top of each other, and it just like, every, like, what is it? But like once it like it's starting to get some length, and it yeah. like can interact in, independently, like then it's like, oh, all right, this this is pretty good. All right. And it takes longer because they're twisted. Yeah, they're right? tw yeah. Like the lady who does my or now my wife does it, but the lady when I first got started with it, she like uses a tool, so it almost looks like if you remember back in the day, the topsy tail, like you know. No. Uh, it's well, ladies would because it's like it's like it looks like a big needle, okay. and so, so it's almost like she does that. Like so, there's so many different ways to do locks. Like you can do a palm roll, like where you get like some beeswax type stuff, and you like sort of roll it, and those like sort of like the what they call like the nappy dreads, like that are a little bit more um, uh, puffier. Sure. Um, and then hers, it, it's um, uh, like it's like you're crocheting your hair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like even though it's like sort of neat and tidy for the most part, it, in the beginning it looked. It looked awkward, uh, and then and then I was like, keep keep because hang in there. <laughs> so the like I was like well, I want to do something different with my hair, and I saw a guy that had locks that like it, they looked beautiful, and I was like I got the courage to add like, this might sound kind of weird, but who did your hair? I really love your hair. Yeah. And then he and then he's like, well, can I get your number? I'm gonna ask her because she doesn't really take a lot of appointments. And if she's open to it, I'm like, yeah, that would be so great. And, the, and her name was Rosina. And this is when I lived in L.A. And then she, um, it took six hours, six yeah. hours to, like, get it done. And then uh, she's like, there's a chance that it may not stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they may just come undone. Mm -hmm. So just FYI. And she, she told me how to take care of it. And then it, like, it finally did it. So much so. So I moved to San Diego. And I would still go up to L.A. Mm. Rosina's the only one who could do my hair, yeah. and um, this—that wasn't even her full-time gig. She she worked in insurance. She wow. just did that on the weekends, and then um, I got so lucky. So she actually came. So me and my wife we got married in L.A. in Malibu. She came 
to the site where I got married to do my hair to get me yes. a little clean up right That's before awesome. we got married. Um, but I again in living in San Diego, going up there um, every six weeks. Granted, we have friends and family up there, so I would just go up there early. She would do my hair, then we'll go see friends and family. And then there was one time when my wife came with me. And then my wife was just curious. She's like, oh, how do you do? And Rosine's like, oh, yeah, you do this, this. And so she, it was like she gave her a lesson. It was almost like the universe was like, you need to learn. Yeah. Because Rosina sent a message out uh, like maybe three months later, like, hey, uh, I'm stopping to all of her yeah. clients. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm going back to school. My fingers are at the end of right? yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't do this can't anymore. Do anymore. And so my wife remembered the lesson. My, yeah. like, I'm like, and then so she went and got the tool. She's like, let's just try it. Yeah. And and if it works, it works. If not, whatever. And then I sent Rosina a few texts, like, "Is she doing it right?" She's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, she's doing it." And so ever since then, my my wife's been doing my hair, that's awesome, which, which is great because um, she's the biggest um, person. Like, yeah, I think I think we need to do your hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's got to look at you every day. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. she's like, "All right, cool. Let, let, let's let's let's." Make <laughs> and if she look doesn't good. like it, you're like, "Well, you did it." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you said every six weeks. Mm -hmm. Is that about when guys with locks should be getting theirs? either twisted or mm -hmm. palm rolled every six weeks or so we don't have we have virtually no content yeah. on locks and so yeah it it varies so so um if if you're if you want to look so fresh and so clean yeah every four to six weeks you should get it get it tied up because that's when the new growth comes yeah. in um and so they're weaving in new growth with the old yeah okay yeah so the new growth happened and so like um uh, I can only speak to, to what I know with, with the tool. And so they the new growth happens and then they take the tool and then it's like they intermix it in and then it gets all tight. Yeah. Uh, with, um, you might be able to get uh, get away with going a little bit longer um, if you were doing like a palm roll. Um, mm -hmm. And then I know people that do palm roll, they're constantly like sort of, uh, sort of uh, you know, twisting their hair and yeah. stuff like that. Um, but they're twisting up new locks. Mm -hmm. Well, it's rather the, than weaving well, it's the new one. Like they're just twisting it, trying to get it to lock where the new growth is. Yeah, yeah. just to get it to like sort of. Um, gotcha. You know, just sort of lock within. Bind in there. So yeah, they would. The so so palm rolling, you would be creating a new lock from new growth versus from new growth. yeah. With the weaved tool. Or, or twisted, yeah. you're you're weaving it into existing locks. Yeah, exactly. And I then, see. Yeah. Okay. And then um and so uh for me, because it is, you know, it, it's mature, I can go a little bit longer and mm -hmm. sometimes I have, but it, it, it hurts like the dickens. Does it? <laughs> because um so with locks, what most people don't realize, and I didn't realize this either, is that because you're not uh like brushing your hair or doing anything with your hair, your your scalp gets super sensitive mm. because it's not getting any friction at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. And then when it gets done, oh my God. Mm. <laughs> I'm like sitting there like. Scribing <laughs> home with tears running down here. Yeah, my wife's like, are you okay? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pain is beauty, pain is beauty. Pain is beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Let's keep. We got this. Yeah, but so like, hilarious. it's super tender and super like, and then, and then after some, like, whoo, yeah, whoo. We're gonna have to have you guys come back for a tutorial, man. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I've uh, like so as far as my hair, um, I cut it twice. So um, when Rosina asked me like what what are, like what are my goals with it, um, I told her like the length that I wanted, and at the time I, I wanted shoulder length. And so get this, the math. So she did the math by how many locks do I need to have it at the length that I want want it because it, it pulls on it. So, yeah. And so like if I wanted it to be longer, she would have done it slightly different so huh. that they weren't, you know, as, as like they were more yeah. or whatever. So because it gets heavy. Sure. Um, and then um, so at one point, like the longest I've gotten it was like, oh, probably about where it is. Um, and then I, I cut it once and then I got shoulder length and then yeah so i cut it twice yeah. to shoulder length each time um and then um now what uh, you know this this length is is pretty good um and i know I'm, you know whatever it's, it's all good but what my wife is starting to do with certain ones she's looking like at the tension because again it's just tension because it's the gravity and it's pulling it's on heavy, itself it's pulling it's very, yeah and so she combines them mm. so she'll she'll use the technique and she's like hey i just i just merged two 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 locks together and then yeah. it gives it more um, a little more structural more integrity st and yeah, scalp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's not going to pull out. Um, Very cool. But yeah, like all this stuff. Like again, I didn't even I didn't even know prior to that. Yeah, and then, and like for guys with straight hair, or guys who don't twist their their hair or get braids or anything like that. Like we're constantly brushing out dead hair, constantly, you know, taking out all that 
old stuff that's either fallen out or broken off, but you're carrying every single hair mm-hmm. that's ever grown from your from your scalp. Yeah. In in your locks. Yeah, and so it doesn't it doesn't release, and so um, because of that, um, as far as uh, maintenance. Um, I mean, not only you know do I get it uh, you know sort of tightened it up um, frequently, but um, when I wash it, I have to have very specific shampoo, like which I make. Like sure. <laughs> it was funny. So I used to buy uh, there was a very specific lock shampoo, uh, and it's it's not it's not cheap. Um, and then um, Rosina, uh, my chick, she's like, look, this is what you do. You go get this, this, and this. And she like she told me she like get the horse and mane shampoo and get some Dr. Bonner's, and then uh, get a few um, uh, essential oils. Uh, and then and then you put it together with some distilled water. Make sure it's distilled water. Okay. Um, and then um, because you you want uh, something that's not going to have a lot of suds because the suds will get stuck in the hair. And so you need it to be uh, very sort of like clear and just sort of uh, run through them like oh wow. and stuff like that. So yeah, oh, it, the nice. the maintenance is Dope. it's a lot. No small bit to it. Yeah. Now the oils and things, you have some nice oils that you use. Do you do that just during your shampoo and conditioner routine or do you use oils in between shampoo? Um, in the locks, no, but on the scalp, yes. Okay. Um, you know, and you don't condition? No. Just wash? Just wash. Okay, and then some oils on the scalp? Yeah, and then and then um, uh, oil the scalp like throughout the week. It's more of a refreshing thing, so it's like a witch... A mix of distilled water and, and witch hazel, okay, um, and then a little bit of oil, and then it um, it keeps the scalp all nice and fresh. Nice, just how you want it. Yeah, rad. What about long hair problems? Well, anything that my, is a my pain first in thing I can't wear hats because I already have a big noggin. Yes, and then That's having another... as much hair it, it adds. So my so I was in ROTC growing up, uh, which is like is like the mini army, and I couldn't be like this in the ROTC, but. In the ROTC, we had to wear hats, and my hat size, this is in high school, and it's been this way, it's seven and three quarters. It's like the biggest hat you can make. Yeah. And then adding on you know, this beautiful hair on top of it, it adds <laughs> like, it, so much more yep. to like, the size of my noggin. Yeah. Um, and so like, wearing hats is like, I used to love wearing hats. Now it's like beanies, but like, that's hot. Yeah. Yes. And so like, yeah, so I'm wearing like, Very you know, Huh? You already have a beanie. It's already, yeah, it's already, yeah. So, like, like headbands and stuff like that, like, I've been, uh, you know, like, someone said, what about visors? I'm like, not, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a big visor guy. So, all right, so I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to ask this question. Uh, you might have seen it. You might not. Have either of you seen House Party? Yeah, can right. play. Right? Did you see the second house party? I uh, saw previews, probably clips. Don't so remember it, the start to finish. So, now. um. So kid, the one that had the big high top face, yes. um, he had a hat, but the top, it was a regular hat, but the top was, was cut, cut out. Off. So it's not a visor, but it's like a regular hat with the top cut off and, 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 his, and his locks came out the top. Like that, if someone could make those, I, w- I would, yes, I w- let me know. But it's not a visor. Like everyone's like, a visor. Like, no, no, a visor is different. This is like- It is still like a, a hat. It's like a new era hat. Right, yeah. with just like the top cut off. Yeah. So that the locks can come out, yeah. and I'm like, you know sold. I've, I've seen some hats. I think maybe Nike wears them. I've seen some. They're like athletic hats, and they have a slit from the from the top button down to the to the uh, whatever you the clasp. Yeah, and you can pull, you know, your ponytail through or whatever. So. You yeah. need a little more of a slit. You'll need a little more, yeah. <laughs> more, yeah, a little yeah, you'll need a little yeah. more than just a little slit. Yeah, but like, yeah, it was so dope. And I know that was probably custom made. Sure. But like, ever since I, like, I've had locks, I've been like on it. I'm like, where do I find these hats? Because I like wearing hats. So that's my problem. That's my main problem is is I, I can't wear hats anymore. Um, you know. That's a serious problem. Yeah. Yeah. You're on a, can, you, can you wear a snapback if you're on like the last? It's so. <laughs> which looks a little silly, right? It looks so silly. Yeah. So it, it is little... like literally like. Like the last one, <laughs> yeah. if that, and then that sometimes pops yeah, out. Yeah, like, yeah, and then yeah. it's like, it's just like, I just have it on just like. <laughs> it's just sitting on top. Yeah, not <laughs> secured. All right. Well. Not the hat wearing experience you're going for. Yeah. yeah. Noted. 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 Maybe we can throw something on the, the R&D list. Yeah, all right. But, but you have, you have the, the headbands, which they, they work. We have the headbands, yes. And the so, head wraps. So you got to try the head wraps. You got to try the hair ties for guys. Yes. And they were swiped from you, it sounded like. Yeah, I have a five-year-old um, who uh, anything dad has is like, oh, 
let me get in on that. What's yours is mine. Yeah, 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 <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's all his, and then it becomes his, and then um, so I'm lucky. So uh, the Jolly Roger is like the one that like I really like. Right now I'm I'm wearing the like the Vegas ones. Uh, am I? I don't know. Um, the high rollers, I baby. Wearing, I think you're wearing the Jolly, Jolly Roger. Yes, I was wearing the high roller yesterday, uh, and I'm lucky to have a few. <laughs> because well, my, my son will have and like and they're gone like literally like I can look everywhere and like I, he has secret hiding spots that I don't even know about but then he will show up with them yeah. and I'm like where'd you find that I'm like oh I just found it it was over there give likely the, story give the people a, a turn so they can see what your uh, how you're rocking the hair ties for guys with the locks nice man that is awesome so a bit of a what do we call almost that like style? the brave the brave yes yeah. minus the braid the yeah. half up the half down yep yes excellent and you were able to get two wraps right there or yeah two wraps yeah Don't okay just, okay just, cool excellent Dope. glad they're working for you yeah is this a should, and your son right? should we even bring up the softies at this point uh well i did just give gary a few uh, we have a new blend here that we're working with that has an additional stretch. So it's, it's a cotton elastic blend that provides a little bit more elasticity than our standard hair ties for guys. Uh, they could stretch out a little bit for you could get that either third in your case or a fourth turn if you have super thick hair, really curly hair or some very dense locks. Uh, so you're going to give it a run, give it a yeah. test run for us and let us know what you think about the softies. Yeah. By the time this show publishes, the softies may be available. Hopefully. Just have to get on our email list, <laughs> and then you'll know. Yeah, speaking of, go to the website, thelonghairs.us. Opt in and subscribe. Yeah. Every week we send out dope, original, fresh, long hair content. This is... P- blog post number 446 assuming we do get finished here and we are able to get this published i'm pretty confident we've done it 445 times so far so we're going to keep it going subscribe to our email list we'll send you the dope weekly freshness and little insider news like secret pro- uh, product releases uh, like the softies for example and gary we tell everyone that you don't need to be a hair expert but there's a few guys that every there's a few things. Yeah, that part. That every guy with long hair needs to know. That's why we offer our quick tips at thelonghairs.us. Just some basic facts and fundamentals uh, for what to do with your flow. Which you can, I I think uh, Gary's visit here has inspired me to take another look and uh, add some locks, braids, content for quick tips. Absolutely. We need more natural hair content. We need yeah. more lock content, braid content. All kinds of stuff. Hit us up. You got locks, braids. You want to run a tutorial. You got a you got an awesome uh, homemade uh, shampoo formula. Share it with us. Comment below. Comment below your lock shampoo. Love to hear it. Love to hear what you got. Gary, where would you like to see the business go? Uh, do you have a vision, your ideal future state for the book, the business, the whole project, your whole personal brand that you've been building here very successfully? Where do you want to see this go? I want play to be a thing that is just a given um, because I we are wired for play. It's in our DNA. And as adults, we forget about it. I want to get to the point where I don't have to like convince you <laughs> that play is essential, that we just we just play. Um, so that would be the ideal thing. And also as far as you know, the stuff that I do, because I, I bring like improv training and, and uh, sort of theatrical arts training. I want that to be as accessible to everyone, um, not just executives that have like, you know, change. I, I want to be able to bring it to, um, you know, um, marginalized communities and, and help them um, reap the benefits just like how I did. So who would be some great clients, whether organizations or companies, uh, if, if someone's listening right now, who would be an ideal person to hire you for your services? Basically, um, if they have a team that they want them to be more productive or they want them to actually stay and they're having a challenge with that, because I know, you know, you've probably heard the term quiet quitting. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to deal with that, hit me up. Brad. Uh, where can we find you, both your business and where can we find Playful yeah. Rebellion? Yeah, so website, breakthroughplay.com. Uh, link to where you can get the book. It's wherever books are sold. So it's on Amazon. It's on um, 
was it bookshop.org is so if you're not a Bezos fan, you can go to bookshop.org where um, a portion of the proceeds do go to uh, local bookshops. Very cool. Bought my last books from that website. I quite liked it. Breakthroughplay.com. Find the book on there or anywhere else. Uh, I'd love to have any of our followers and fans connect with you and get some serious playtime going. Yeah. Uh, it's been great having you, Gary. Likewise. Thank you, gents. Thanks so much for coming. Appreciate out. you yeah. coming down. And uh, this is a hit home for me a little bit. I'm going to be thinking more about playing and that rest and rejuvenation and what do we need to do to, to get ourselves back up to full speed. Yeah, I got you. All right. Well, uh, we'll have, we'd love to have you on again. Oh, there's one question I neglected to mention. Uh, are you familiar with The Great Cut? No. Tell me more. Uh, so, so, it's a question we ask our guests if they can commit to the great cut. Don't worry, we're not going to ask you. Okay, it's uh, all good. It's a charity haircutting event Ooh. we hosted in 2019. The long hairs broke the Guinness World Records title for the most hair donated to charity in 24 hours. Uh, it was a phenomenal event. It was right here at the Port Pavilion on Broadway Pier in San Diego. Had a great crowd, all-day event. Guinness World's book adjudicator uh, was there measuring, and it all came down. We broke the record. So we are doing it again in 2024, and we tell everyone, no one's going to tell you to cut your hair, but we would love to have you come and join should you decide to donate. Uh, our charity partner is Children With Hair Loss. They do accept locks, and actually, last time we did have several locks donors. All right. But again, not going to uh, ask you to make that commitment at this point, but we would love to have you there. And uh, we'll share a little bit more about it between now and then. We've got about a year and a half until the big yeah. event. Yeah. And if you guys are curious at home watching, head to thegreatcut.us. We've got recap videos, all the info you need for 2024, past photos. You'll get a good idea of what 2024 will look like, but it's going to be bigger and better and more hair, more whips, more music, more beers, more of everything. It's a hair whipping karate kicking charity haircutting event that's right so you'll get the formal invite gary but we hope you'll hope you'll join us yeah i'll be there all right well thanks again everyone go and check out playful rebellion uh, i've enjoyed perusing through it but i'm going to take a little deeper dive having uh, had you on the show here until next time keep letting it ride see you